All right, Galatians chapter 5, expository study. If you've been with us here for the last five weeks, uh, then hopefully you've learned something. Hopefully the Lord has showed you things through His Word, the King James Bible, as we've been studying through this book of the Bible. Very interesting book about Christians, about, well, people that are professing Christians at least, um, being told that they have to go back under the law to be saved. And they're going back under the law. It wasn't just that they were being told these things, they were actually going back and trying to get back under the law. And uh, so we are going to continue here in chapter 5. You can turn your King James Bible to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It says here, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And it's interesting there, it talks about the yoke of bondage. That's one thing lost people all have in common. All lost people are in bondage. You say, how's that work? Well, lost people are in bondage to sin. I mean, how can a lost person get away from sin? They don't have the Holy Spirit within them. So they have no chance at, you know, overcoming certain sins. They can't do it. Now, they might give up one sin, but then they'll get another one. You know, they have no power within them to really, truly not be in bondage to sin. They're also in bondage to false religion. That's another thing that lost people are in bondage to. You know, that's why a lot of them are afraid to leave the cult that they are in. You know, they're scared to death to leave it. You know, um, they're in bondage to the world. They care about what the world thinks of them. That's another reason why a lot of people don't want to get saved. Because they're in bondage to the world. What about my job? What about my friends? What about my family? I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. That's why they don't get saved. That's why they reject Jesus Christ. And, of course, the big one is they're in bondage to Satan. They are children of the devil. When they disobey, when they hear the gospel for the first time and they disobey, they become children of disobedience and ultimately children of the devil. So they are definitely in bondage to him. So they're, you know, what Paul is saying here in verse 1 is that they're to stand fast. What that means is, if you think of shoes, take a pair of shoes and fasten them down with nails so that they don't move, then you get in those shoes. You are standing fast. You're not moving. You know, stubbornness. You know, stand fast and therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What was the yoke of bondage? Your past lost life. Don't go back to those sins. Galatians chapter 5, verse 2. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Okay? Now, when you're going back under the law to try and be justified, to try and say that you're saved by that, that's wrong. But the fact of the matter is, you say, well, then we don't have to keep the laws anymore. No, in terms of, you know, God's certain laws and things like that that are in the Pauline epistles, there are a lot of commands for a Christian today. And if you've seen my sermon about Ten Commandments for, you know, are the Ten Commandments for us today or something, I forget what it was called. But I talked about how that you can find most of those Ten Commandments within the Pauline epistles. Okay, you say, well, wait a second then. We're not supposed to go back under the law, but we're supposed to keep the law? How does that make sense? Well, very simple. Because you see, when you get saved, keeping God's law will become a natural thing. Why? You have the Holy Spirit within you now. Let me show you this. You can turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. We're going to see about this thing of, you know, when you get saved, what happens? Again, if you've seen last week's study, you saw that I was talking about real versus false conversion. Those that are born after the flesh, those that are born after the spirit. Okay, When you have false converts, they're just fleshly. They're not really Holy Spirit filled. They're not, they don't have the Holy Spirit of God in them. That's why they are in bondage to sin yet. That's why they mess around with sin. That's why they won't accept truth. All right, But when you get saved, it's not about, okay, I'm saved. I have to do things to prove that I'm saved. No. God's Holy Spirit comes in, and that's, that's the whole situation there. All right? 
the Lord Jesus Christ takes over your life at that point in time. You are now his child. You know, so that's why things change. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Um, who wears yokes? Slaves? Put a collar around the neck. Like that. Are you wearing a yoke of Jesus Christ? Just Does the Lord Jesus Christ control your life? Does he convict you when you sin? Has he corrected you? Has he had to chasten you at different times? You're nodding yes if you're a Christian. If you're nodding no to that, then you're not saved. You say, well, I, I profess to be saved. doesn't matter. When you get saved, you know, they say, oh, it's all about Jesus. Salvation is all about Jesus. It's exactly true. And when you have that life that's all about Jesus, now... Jesus is going to tell you what to do. He's going to tell you what things you should watch, what things you should eat, what things, all that stuff. And if you aren't following those laws that the Lord has laid down in His Word, those laws that are all helpful, by the way, if you're not following those laws, it's going to come out in your life. You're going to be punished for it. And if you're without chastisement, in the book of Hebrews it says, then are ye bastards and not sons. Okay, what's a bastard? Somebody that doesn't know the father. A child that doesn't know who its father is. Like a lot of professing Christians, they don't know God the Father. That's why you see a lot of these modern professing Christians, they say, I just can't relate to the God of the Bible, you know, God of the Old Testament. Well, that's because you're a bastard. Speaking scripturally here. I'm trying to, you know, use foul language or something there. That's what the Bible term bastard means. Galatians chapter 5, verse 5. You can go back there to Galatians. Galatians 5, verses 5 and 6. Okay, it says, For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in G Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. All right? The fact is the process of salvation, or I'm sorry, the process of sanctification, excuse me, the process of sanctification after salvation will require two things, love and time, all right? You say, what's the love for? Well, love for the world, love for compromise, love for Hollywood, love for rock music, love for... Whoa, wait a second, no. <laughs> That's what lost people think. No, the process there, the love that comes is love for the Lord, love for His Word, love for the brethren, and love for the lost. That's true scriptural love. And it's funny because a lot of times the lost world doesn't view our love as love. <laughs> they view it as judging me and, and you're being you know harsh and bigoted and narrow-minded and whatever else. No, actually, we're trying to love you. If you're lost and you're watching this video, when I tell you you're going to hell, that's actually love. How can that be love? Because I don't want you to go there. If I didn't love you, I'd just say, oh, no. God has special plans for you. God is wonderful. God is good. And He wants you in heaven. No matter what you do or what you say or what you believe. You know, just believe in Jesus and don't have any change in your life. Don't, you know, come to Him as a sinner. Don't, you know, anything. There's no repentance involved. See, that's what the lost world wants to hear. But that's not love. True love is telling somebody the truth. Speaking the truth in love. So what we're supposed to do. Galatians chapter 5 verse 7 says here, Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? They are running well. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verses 24 through 27 speaks about this thing of running. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, 
But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Okay, so what's going on there? Paul is speaking about his run, the race that he is in. I mean, you think about it. When you get saved, how much time do you have before your death? Not very long. Most people probably 30, 40, 50 years at the most of salvation. That's not a whole lot of time to earn rewards that you'll have for eternity. Not a whole lot of time. So what you need to do is when you get saved, you need to go, Oh man, I better start running. I better start working for the Lord. I better start doing things so that I can have rewards when I get to heaven, when I get to the judgment seat of Christ, and when I get to the millennial kingdom. I want to be able to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. I better get running. Okay? It's very important. And the very fact of the matter is, if you are constantly trying to work on your salvation to stay saved, and i got to try to clean up the flesh here and everything else, works-based salvation will hinder you from doing the work of the Lord. Why? You don't know that you yourself are saved. How can you tell other people that you're, that, to, how to get saved when you don't know for yourself? So it's a big problem there. You know, and there's a very simple thing that you need to remember, okay? You cannot work for God if you are working for salvation. Plain and simple. If you are so interested in making sure that you get into heaven and, and working and working and working, trying to get yourself saved and doing all these good works and everything else, you're not going to work for the Lord, You'll think you are, but, you know, it's just good deeds to get yourself saved, to merit salvation and things like that. You know, see, it doesn't work. You know, and what was going on here in, in, with these believers in Galatia? Well, they were running well, and Paul's like, well, I, you know, think that these people are saved, but then all of a sudden, they're being hindered, and they're not obeying the truth anymore. So bad, so much so, and, and it's getting so bad there that Paul's going, I stand in doubt of you. If you saw last week's sermon, Paul's going, I desire to be present with you and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. I don't even know if you people are saved. I, you know, I come to you and you're, and you're, oh, Brother Paul, Brother Paul. But then I go away and I hear all these reports coming out about you guys. See? And you'll meet Christians that are like that, by the way. You know, around certain brethren there, oh, God bless you, brother, and oh, I love the Bible and everything else. They get around other people, they're totally different. You say, what do you think about people like that? I stand in doubt of them. Yeah, definitely. Galatians 5, 8 says here, This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. Okay, if you remember in the first verse there, it said, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So, the persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. Who's the him? The Lord Jesus Christ. He has called these people, and, and Paul's saying, I don't know if you people are saved or not. I have no idea anymore. I stand in doubt of you. But the fact of the matter is, what you're doing, that persuasion there, this thing of going back under the Old Testament laws to try and justify yourself, try to save yourself, whatever, that persuasion did not come from the Lord Jesus Christ that called you. All right? Jesus Christ is not for works-based salvation. All right, right now. Okay, I'll say it that way. Works-based salvation will be there in the millennial kingdom. Okay, why? Well, faith is the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about that. Jesus Christ will be physically on the earth. So salvation in the time, in that millennial kingdom time period is going to have to be by works. So, but right now, works is not the means of salvation. All right. Galatians chapter 5, verse 9. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Okay, that's a very important thing, and it's actually a very scientific statement. You put a little bit of leaven, or, you know, another way to say it would be yeast, a little bit of yeast into a thing of dough, it's going to get through the whole thing of dough. The whole ball, the whole ball of dough is going to be, excuse me, leavened, by that little bit. It doesn't take much. You say, what is this leaven? Let's look about that. Matthew chapter 16, 
starting at verse 1. We're going to see here what this thing of leaven is. Matthew 16, verse 1. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. Interesting. Verse 5. And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Now look at their reaction. It's kind of funny. Verse 7. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. <laughs> no, that's not it. Keep reading. Verse 8. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves, because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? How is it that you do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware, uh, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they that how, excuse me. Then understood they how that he bade them not to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So the leaven there that he was warning them about was doctrine, false doctrine. That was that's what was going on there, all right. But you know, you say, boy, those disciples were sure kind of dopey sometimes. Yeah, kind of like us. You know, sometimes the Lord tells us things, and, uh, you know, all of us, I'm talking about me as well as you out there, the Lord will tell you things to do, and, you know, a lot of times you don't listen. You know, you get kind of dopey with the Lord, you know. <laughs> so don't think that you're better than the disciples, because you're not, and I'm not either. Luke chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says here, In the meantime, when, they, when there were gathered together an, an innumerable multitude of people, and so much that they trode one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, First of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, now look at this, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Why did Paul say in verse 9 there in Galatians chapter 5, you can go back there, Galatians chapter 5 verse 9, A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. What's he talking about? false doctrine and hypocrisy. And it's interesting because false doctrine leads to hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. So what Paul is saying is that little bit of leaven that's in here, the false doctrine of saying you have to go back under the Old Testament law to be saved, to be justified, you know. And the other part of the leaven there is hypocrisy. You know, when he's there, when Paul's there, it's, oh, Brother Paul, yeah, we agree, we agree, we agree. But when he's gone, they're acting totally different. See? And Paul's saying, this whole lump is leaven. <laughs> Your whole assembly here in Galatia, you guys are leavened. This false doctrine has corrupted in and has created hypocrisy. Very interesting. But... Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 10 through 12. We'll read these verses here. It says, I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would that they were even cut off which trouble you. Okay? Now there again... You under, there's something else you need to understand in this life, and that is false teachers are always going to come to nothing. There's never going to be a point in time when a false teacher is just going to continue on and continue on and continue on. You know, when you get around 
professing, you know, Christians and things like that, if there's a false teacher there and you know the King James Bible, you know the book well, God will reveal it to you that that person's false. He always will. They will come to nothing. You know? Let me show you some proof of this. Acts chapter 5. You can turn there in your Bible. Acts chapter 5, verse 34 through 39. And we're going to see this thing here of, you know, and this is a, this is a very key scripture here, especially verses 38 and 39. Very, very important verses. But uh, let's read here, Acts chapter 5, verse 34. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space, and said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Thutius, uh, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about four hundred, joined themselves who was slain, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing, and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, like this, here's, here's where the key really starts to come in here. Refrain from these men and let them alone. Here we go. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. And, you know, I will say God will allow false prophets, false teachers, people that are messed up and things like that. But eventually he will silence them. Eventually he will expose them as being false. If it's a work of men, it will come to naught. It'll come to nothing. It's, it'll just fall apart. It won't do anything. But if it be of God, you can't stop it. So what's Paul saying back here in Galatians chapter 5? You can turn back there. He's saying, I would they were even cut off to trouble you. You know? And I believe that those people eventually were that were troubling the believers in Galatia. Oh boy, excuse me. Been a long day. But uh, let's continue here. I'll try not to fall asleep or anything, you know, on camera here. If if I do, just yell or something and wake me up again, okay? Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Okay? And again, to say it again here, yeah, one of the most important things that you need to understand is all sin is negative. Every single sin that's out there. And what you need to do as a Christian is you need to avoid sin as much as possible. I mean, I, as I've said before, you're never going to get to a point where you've gotten rid of all sin out of your life. That's not going to happen. There's no such thing as sinless perfection outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? But the point is you need to stay away from sin. Sin is negative. It's very, very negative, and it's got a very unique aspect to it in that it's self-punishing. <laughs> when you sin, you'll be punished for it, oftentimes because of the sin that you just committed. You say, give me an example. Okay, you go out drinking. What do you get? A hangover? And that's the least thing that will happen to you. Some people get, you know, in a bad accident or commit adultery or whatever else, you know. Yeah, bad things happen because of sin. You smoke cigarettes for years and years and years, you get emphysema, cancer. See? I have all those things. You look at pornography, it messes up your mind. You know? You have a filthy, dirty, rotten mind everywhere you go. You can't think pure thoughts anymore because you messed around with pornography. And you can go through all the different sins. All sin is negative. All right there? So, you, yes, you do have liberty to commit those sins. You're not going to lose your salvation if you commit a sin like that. But what you have to understand is don't use that liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Don't say, okay, well, you know, I guess I'll just, I'll give in this one time. I'll just do a little bit, you know, a little bit doesn't hurt. Stay away from it. Best thing that you can do is abstain from it. And the Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. So even the appearance of some sins, I just uh, stay away from it. 
Don't need to be around it. But let's continue here. Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Okay, so you see this thing of love. Now let's define what kind of love this is here according to the Bible. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. In other words, not without hypocrisy. Don't go to people and tell them that you love them when you don't really love them. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Verse 10, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them, with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, if you want a really good uh, definition, scriptural definition of what kind of love we're supposed to have, that's it right there. Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21 there. It's all those verses speaking about the right kind of love that we're supposed to have. And again, you see the time and time again, this aspect of self-sacrifice in with those different types of love. There, there's different actions. There's a self-sacrificial uh, aspect to it. And what is that? It's charity. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is all about charity. All right. The greatest thing that a Christian can manifest in their life is charity. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. Read a little bit more here about um, brotherly love that we're supposed to have. Okay, it says here, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more, and that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without and that ye may have lack of nothing. All right. So again, you see this thing there of love, of charity for one another. That's supposed to be there as a Christian. You're supposed to have that love. All right. Again, it's an aspect of the Lord that comes into your life because of him owning you and his Holy Spirit being within you. Let's go back to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 15. We're going to see there, we saw love. Now, what's the opposite of love? Verse 15. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. You know, uh, one of the most um, influential, negative influential things that can drive a Christian out of the ministry? Other Christians. Why? They bite and devour them. You know, they'll start to attack them. They'll start to put them down and, and you know, just, you know, oh, excuse me. They'll make their life miserable. And they discourage that brother. And the brother says, okay, you know what? There's better things I can do with my time. I'm leaving. You know, I'm out of here. What happened? They bite. They were biting and devouring one another and they consumed one another. That's a mistake. That's why, you know, a while back I talked about the gap theory on one of my videos and there was a lot of biting and devouring among the brethren over that, you know, issue, which to me is just a ridiculous thing. And what happened? People were devouring one another. And so I shut the video down I, or shut the comments down. I had to re go in and take a whole bunch of stuff out and restart the comments again. It's crazy. 
See, it's carnal what that thing was. Should never have happened. And, uh, you know, again, another thing I want to say, as far as, you know, the thing of if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one on another. You should have love for the brethren. Yeah, sure, you should. But the fact of the matter is, if you can't get along with them as a brother or sister in the Lord, you have no obligation to stay there and be buddy-buddy with them and work out your differences. Just get away from them, okay? Why? You're running a race. You are here for a specific purpose. You are not here to get along with all the brethren. That's just not going to happen. You are here to serve Jesus Christ with your life. Make sure that that's the center and focal point of your walk, of your race that you are running. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, is walking a active or a passive word? Active. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. See, that's going to take action on your part. That isn't just going to come naturally. Right? You're going to have to learn to walk in the Spirit so that the flesh stays down. Psalm 119 verse 9 says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. The way that you stay clean, the way that you stay in a right relationship with the Lord is right here. Read your Bible, pray every day, witness to people. That's it. Right there. If you put... It, I'm not going to tell you to do this because I think some people would and you would probably really mess up your lives. But if you put this book down for a week, don't even open it up, don't even listen to an audio King James Bible or don't, you know, see it online or whatever. I mean, no interaction at all with the King James Bible for a week. I'll tell you, your life is going to start falling apart. If you go a month without it, I would say you're headed for very serious sin. Extremely serious sin. I mean, you'll struggle with sin reading this book every day. You know, and if you put the thing down for a month, your goose is cooked. It's a bad thing. But continuing here, Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. It says here, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. The flesh and the spirit cannot be made to get along. You know, people have this funny notion in this world, this whole Antichrist, uh, New World Order system, and that is that we should all just get along. Can't we all just get along, you know, and stuff? I mean, everybody out there should eventually join hands. Well, the interesting thing about that is that is so completely unscriptural for a number of reasons, but one of the big reasons is the Lord is saying right here in this passage, you can't even get along with your own flesh. The Holy Spirit living within you can't even be made to reconcile the differences between the Spirit and the flesh. How on earth, if, if we can't even get along with ourselves, <laughs> how are we going to get along with other people, lost people? doesn't work. So what do you have to do? You have to crucify the flesh. Of the two that you want to be in control, you want the Holy Spirit to be in control of your life, not your flesh. But we're going to read here John chapter 4, verse 21 through 24. Some interesting verses here. It says, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. You know what the interesting thing is? What is God's Holy Spirit? The spirit of truth. So you see again, you can't you can't reconcile flesh and spirit just the same as you can't say, well, I want spirit but not truth. 
See? If you have the Holy Spirit, you will also have the truth. The two are intermeshed. See? You can't take the flesh and the spirit and put them together. They're contrary the one to the other. It doesn't work. But spirit and truth, yeah, they do come together. And you can't have one without the other. If you have the truth, then you have the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, then you have truth. It's very simple. See? So when you have somebody that says they have the Holy Spirit and they don't want anything to do with the truth, that's a problem. Galatians chapter 5, verse 18. By the way, that whole thing there, they that worship the Father must worship Him in spirit, him in spirit and in truth. That's why your modern rock and roll, you know, mega Bible buildings, that's why they're not of God because they're trying to combine flesh and spirit. It doesn't work. And the flesh wins in their case, which proves that they're lost. Galatians chapter 5, verse 18, But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, says here, But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the go glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. All right. If you're saved and led of the Spirit, you know, the, which the two go hand in hand, then you are not under the same condemnation as the lost world. The lost people are under the law. Which there again, that debunks the whole thing, this, this modern day easy believism nonsense, which says that lost people can't understand that they're sinners. Total, total lie. That is not true. Why? Lost people are under the law. They're there to, to give an account. Hey, you stole, you've lied, you took God's name in vain. <sighs> Excuse me. You broke the law. You're convicted. You're a sinner. You're on your way to hell. Lost people can understand that. They can totally understand that. That's what keeps them from getting saved, you know, because they know I'm a sinner and I'm going to have to give up these sins if I get saved. That's why they don't want to get saved. But let's go back here. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. In other words, you can see them all around you in the world. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, so what are you seeing there? Well, you're seeing a whole list of fleshly things and if you see a a major emphasis on any of these things in there you're dealing in somebody's life you're dealing with somebody who is very much given over to the flesh and you know you really have to be careful around somebody like that okay now you say but what's it mean there it says about you know they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of god does that mean that if you do those things you don't go to heaven uh, no, because we're going to see here that there are two definitions for the term kingdom of God. Okay, first of all is Romans chapter 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So it's not a kingdom. It's not heaven or something like that. The kingdom of God is spiritual fellowship between you and the Lord. Luke chapter 17, verse 20 and 21 says, and when he was demanded of, the, demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So, what is the kingdom of God? Well, according to those two passages, the kingdom of God is spiritual fellowship between you and the Lord. So now, 
if you're living in these sins up here in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, if you're doing those sins, you're not going to have spiritual fellowship with the Lord. You're going to be out of fellowship with God. It doesn't mean you're lost. It just means that you're not in fellowship with the Lord. Okay? But there's another way to look at this kingdom of God thing. Let's go to Luke chapter 13, verse 28 through 30. We're going to see here another definition of this term, kingdom of God. It says here, There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there are last which shall be first and there are first which shall be last. All right, what's this talking about? Well, it's obvious it's talking about the millennial kingdom. All right, um, and these Jews are saying basically they're going to see, you know, all these people coming and sitting down in the kingdom of God, that millennial kingdom. And the Jews themselves are going to be thrust out. Sorry, you didn't make it. Out you go. They rejected Jesus Christ. Pretty incredible. You say, well, how can I have a part in that kingdom? Well, if you're saved, here's how you get in. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 through 13 says here, It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth, abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So you see there, if you suffer for Jesus Christ, you will reign with him. If you don't suffer, you won't reign. Works pretty good. So you say, well, which kingdom of God is it then? Is it spiritual fellowship with the Lord or is it the millennial kingdom? That, you know, if you do these things in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, you don't get that kingdom. You don't get the fellowship or you don't get the millennial reign. Which one? Well, honestly, I think it's both. If you're messing around with sin, you're not going to be in good fellowship with the Lord. And if you're messing around with those sins, you're not suffering for the Lord. Okay, you're suffering for sin. You're suffering because you are sinning. That's not going to earn you millennial kingdom rewards. So I believe it actually works both ways. You're going to be out of fellowship with the Lord and you are not going to inherit anything in the kingdom that's coming. If you mess around with Galatians 5.19 through 21. But now let's look at verses 22 through 23 here. Okay, it says, but the fruit. Notice it is a singular word there. Fruit. It's not fruits of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit. And there are nine characteristics of that fruit. Not nine different fruits, but actually nine different characteristics of the one fruit of the Spirit. And I have a sermon on that too. You can look that up. But it says here, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Okay? Now let me clarify here. Um, there is no good law. Okay? There are some times when you will try to be you know, meek and, and temperate and you'll have joy and whatever else. And there, are, there will be laws against that. Okay, there will be laws against you as a Christian. So, you know, you have to define things here. You know, there's no law against these things, the fruit of the Spirit, um, unless it's a very crooked and wicked, you know, governmental system. So, which, you know, you're not obliged to listen to them anyhow with their warped laws. But uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 24 says here, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. You know, you say, well, how do I crucify the flesh? That, that sounds kind of painful. Well, it is in some ways. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So, we are supposed to present our bodies a living sacrifice, 
wholly acceptable unto God, as it were supposed to do. And part of that is you can't be conformed to the world. I mean, you have to stay away from the, the cares and the, and the deceitfulness of the world. And if you become worldly as a Christian, you're not going to be able to prove what is the good and perfect or good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You're just not going to be able to do it. And you're going to lose rewards and you're going to lose millennial inheritance and you're going to lose a lot of things. You know, just something that you really need to keep in mind. All right, Galatians chapter 5, verse 25 and 26 says here, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 7 says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Okay, so as a Christian, you're not supposed to desire vain glory. And by the way, anything that you get from man down here, be they earned degrees or doctorate degrees or honorary degrees or whatever else, anything that you can get from man down here is definitely vain glory. It's not going to mean anything in eternity. All right. But when you get to eternity and you're actually there and the Lord commends you in front of all of heaven, uh, yeah, that's going to be a little bit better than anything you can get down here on the earth. That's not vain glory. Okay, that's real glory. And there's not going to be any buying people off or whatever or slipping in or, you know, you know, and, and getting behind the scenes and telling people to give out awards certain ways. That's not going to be there. It's going to be a total, total honest judgment when we get to be with the Lord. It's going to be really amazing. So that's going to do it for Galatians chapter 5. Let me just do something here really quickly. I have this... Uh, heater on underneath the table it is still very cold here uh, it's still getting down into the 20s and 30s at night here in uh, northeastern maine and uh so you know gets a little bit chilly here in the production room so i have this heater on underneath the table but now it's putting me to sleep i'm sitting here you know because it's just too warm underneath the table so but you know Part of crucifying the flesh, brethren, is sometimes pushing your body. And uh, when you should be getting rest and you should be doing this and you should be doing that, sometimes you just have to push a little bit harder. Uh, that's part of crucifying the flesh. Part of crucifying the flesh is sitting around reading your Bible when there's better things to do. When you'd rather go out and go for a bike ride or go for a walk in the woods or walk in the park or whatever. Um, sometimes it's better to read your Bible. You know, uh, when you're tempted to play a video game, why don't you read your Bible instead? When you're going to go to the mall or when you're going to go out shopping or whatever, you're going to take some tracks along, put them out. See, that's walking in the Spirit. That's not fulfilling the desires of the flesh. The desires of the flesh is going on to have a good time. Don't worry about witnessing. Don't worry about reading your Bible this morning you got stuff to do, just go on out and do it. Don't worry about praying. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about that. Just have a good day. See? That's what's going on there. That's fulfilling the desires of the flesh. And that's what, as a Christian, you need to fight against that. You need to say, no, no, I, I don't care. I know I'm running a little bit behind here, but i got to read the Bible. You know, i got to witness. i got to do this. i got to do that. You go out to the store and the Lord... Puts it in your mind, put a track right there. And you say, okay, you know, and you do it. See, that's what it means to be a living sacrifice. And as time goes by, you'll give up more and more and more of your free time. You'll give up more and more and more of your dreams and your aspirations and your all this stuff until the Lord has your life. And when you get to that point, that's when you're in the perfect will of God. When God has you, right where he wants you to be. You are in his perfect will at that point in time. I can't tell you what it is for your life. You're going to have to figure that out for yourself. 
You know, if the Lord's given you certain skills and talents and things like that that you can use for Him and you see, hey, there's a need here that I need to do, whatever, go in that direction. All right, run that way. We're running a race. And you need to run in that direction. You know, where the Lord's given you your talents and skills and things. So, that's going to be it for Galatians chapter 5. Uh, next week we'll be finishing up the book of Galatians and then uh, just want to I want to get back to some subject preaching because that's really I believe my true calling I can do the thing of you know this uh, expository stuff and I do enjoy doing some expository preaching now and then but really my my calling from the Lord is lays more in subject preaching and I've had a lot of people request sermons and you know I just I need to get to do, doing those sermons, so I'm probably going to put off the expository thing. Maybe towards the end of the month, I might get back into it. You know, the month of May. I'm saying, um, we'll see. I'm not sure. Maybe into June or something as well. I don't know. But there's a lot of work to be done right now. And uh, something else that I've been really kind of struggling with a lot is. Uh, I'm just not getting a lot of my work done, and I think that the reason is because there's just so much coming out right now, so many things, and I'm just like trying to stay ahead of everything, and my problem is I'm too much of a perfectionist, and so I will look and I see evidence, I see proof of something, and it's like, okay, I can put that into this study over here, and I try to find more information for this study, and then I'm working on this study over here, and I'm trying to find stuff for this, and I'm trying to do... And I'll, I'll have like 10 different studies going at one time trying to prepare these things. I'm too much of a perfectionist that way. So what I'm, what I'm trying to do, what my wife and I are both trying to do is we're trying to just simply come out with shorter, harder hitting videos that lead people into the longer stuff. But just, just kind of, you know, when we find out information, get it out. And try, instead of trying to put the thing, make it into a huge big documentary film or something, you know, and just get out more information. So uh, please pray for God's direction and leading in that because, you know, it's hard for me because I want to do my very, very best. And I can still do my best presenting less information, but, you know, it's just things are, are increasing so rapidly now. Uh, there's just no time to sit back and really analyze things, you know. I mean, it's just like, you know, I can imagine kind of like an artillery post at a military base and one shot comes in and hits outside the perimeter of the base and the artillery guy goes, okay, uh, range, and he goes over and he, he gets the range and he gets the elevation and everything and he says, okay, uh, fire poof, boom and hits over here now okay let's redo the range a little bit more let's go another couple degrees this way another couple degrees that way and you you know i'm doing this but all of a sudden there's a lot of attacks coming in the base is just getting hit like crazy there's no time to make precision measurements anymore you just start aiming that artillery gun wherever you can and just start shooting <laughs> you know start dropping bombs and uh, that's what i want to do I want to really get more, just a lot more videos coming out that are just hitting targets. And a lot of this stuff is going to tie together, you know. But my problem has been that I've been waiting and really, really trying to aim the guns and focus in on certain subjects, whereas I just need to bring out the information. And a lot of it, you know, I know a lot of you, my viewers, are, are intelligent enough that you'll see where I'm going with a lot of this stuff and you'll put the pieces together. I just need to be bringing out the proof, you know, and, and I want to do a lot more, too, for lost people as well. Uh, do some more salvation types of things and stuff like that. So, uh, my main, but there again, I'm not going to forsake the main ministry, which is, um, you know, edifying the brethren, exhorting the brethren, uh, teaching the Word of God. That's, that's what I'm called to do. So, I guess we will close here with a word of prayer and then... Next week, we're going to get into Galatians chapter 6. So, 
All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you again, Lord, for the challenge from your word. I thank you, Lord, uh, for the list, Lord, of, of uh, the lusts of the flesh and that they are very much manifest in our day, <clears throat> in our time now, and, and we can see all these wicked sins. And I know a lot of Christians get caught up in them, and, and I just pray, Lord, for the viewers right now out there, the people watching this video, that they would uh, just examine themselves, and, and if they have any of these lusts of the flesh in their life, that they would get rid of them, Lord, that you would convict them out there, and and uh, help them to get rid of these lusts out of their life. And help them to work on the fruit of the Spirit, Lord. And that they would be uh, very fruitful Christians. And um, I pray, Lord, that, that none of them would get entangled again with the yoke of bondage of sin. That they wouldn't go back into that old lost world and, and start messing around with sins of the flesh. And, and uh, end up being shipwrecked. I pray, Lord, that you would... Help them to avoid that. And I just uh, ask all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. We're going to close here. And uh, I guess we're going to see you next week with Galatians chapter 6. I think I need to get some sleep. A little bit tired. So a lot going on right now as usual, as is typical. And, you know, of course... You know, being in ministry nowadays, you're going to get attacked spiritually. And there's a lot of that. And it just, there are days when it's really, really, really bad. And there are days when it's not so bad. And, you know, writing the, you know, it took me a couple days even to get these notes done for Galatians chapter 4, 5, and 6. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that, you know. And uh, so when I'm really studying the Word, I'll, I really try to, you know, Put in some good time into studying these scriptures out and things. And there's certainly going to be a lot more of that in the future. But like I said, I also need to really work hard on just getting information out there. So, like I said, just pray for me as I'm going through this transition time. My wife and I both are going to really, um, we're really feeling pressure right now um, from just the way the world's going to get as much out as we can. You know, so that's going to be it. Thank you to everybody who's praying for the ministry. Please don't ever stop praying. Please don't ever think, well, you know, they're they're fine now. They've been prayed enough for, you know, we can take some time off praying for Brian and Catherine. No, no, please don't stop praying. And uh, we really do need your prayers. And, of course, everybody that donates, we do thank you for the donations. Uh, it's a major blessing, and just it helps us to keep going. And uh, I know the Lord will, will reward you for that. So that will be it. We will see you next week with Galatians chapter 6, and we will finish up the book of Galatians.